Okay, we'll get started. So this workshop is the second one and this is all about planting your garden. And what we're going to talk about is preparing for planting, what you need, how to plant seeds and live plants. It's different. Um, fertilizing tips, preventing weeds with mulch, watering and irrigation, and how to set up trellises. Um, we've talked about this. We're a little ahead of this, actually. We're doing really great this year. I think there's only six gardens left to till. And um, um, so we're checking them off and getting there. Um, but once you do have your tilling, um, it's a good time to look back at your plan and start establishing your perimeter and your uh, footpaths. Now, when you when you set out to uh, start planting, you'll want to you'll want to take some things with you, and we'll just cover that real quick. You need your seeds or your plants, obviously. You're going to want some fertilizer with you. You want to fertilize at the time of planting, regardless. Uh, uh, seeds or live plants. You're going to need, at a minimum, some sort of hand trowel. Depending on the quality and looseness of your soil, you may need a shovel as well. Post hole diggers do great for deep stuff like tomatoes, you know, these large things that you're putting in every two feet or whatever. I found post hole diggers to be really uh, good. And um, uh, let's see, a hoe is a classic garden tool. It's great for scratching in long rows. If you're going to be planting a seed every three inches or so, no, you don't want to dig a hole every three inches. That'd be crazy, right? So you, you scratch a, we'll, we'll talk more about it later. It may not sound crazy, but you scratch a, 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 a trench uh, with the hoe. Um, a stiff tooth rake, incredibly useful in a garden. I use it all the time. Um, um, uh, you can use the short end of that to scratch trenches in just like you do with a hoe. It's great for uh, moving and leveling dirt. Um, it's great for filling in your trench after you plant it and all of that. Wheelbarrow, um, it depends, could be very handy. And you do need water uh, at the time of, of planting. So when we're talking about seeds, there's always this question it's like, do I soak this? Do I soak that or whatever? You can soak anything. Actually soaking anything speeds up a good bit of time that it takes to, uh, to germinate. If you imagine the first couple of days a seed is in the ground, it's mostly softening and absorbing water. So if you can do that in a, in a so like, for example, when I, last year, when I went out to plant all my beans, First thing that morning, just like if I was going to cook a meal, I put my beans in the soak. And then by, the, by that afternoon, when it was time to put them in the ground, they were kind of soft and they looked like they were ready to go and pop, you know. But that that uh, uh, bypassed a couple of days on the ground. We were already that far ahead towards uh, Germany. So if it's a large seed, obviously they're... Uh, um, easier to deal with. I have soaked, I have soaked, uh, cabbage seeds and, um, um, cilantro seeds, parsley seeds, you know, when doing in trays too, just to get a step ahead. Um, consult the seed packet for the spacing and depth. um, scratch a trench for each row of seeds. In your bed if it's things that plant far apart trench thing not a good not the best way to do it then you'll want to use your trowel or your shovel to uh, plant individual holes uh, we're going to hand out some fertilizer uh, tonight we'll talk more about fertilizer in general in a little bit but um, you want to put about two two tablespoons per row foot or per plant. So if you're planting every two feet, you put a couple of tablespoons of fertilizer in the hole uh, for each plant. 
if you're going all the way down the road, uh, think about it as two table. You don't have to write this down. We'll, we'll get more into the amounts in a minute. I should actually take this out, I think. It's confusing. We'll get to that later. All right. So once you space your seeds in the trench, you can cover it with soil and lightly tamp it down uh, with your garden, right? And then water thoroughly. Now, before you start to see growth out of these seeds, you, you got you to gotta keep them wet, which can be time consuming. And, and you, you got some, some things are very forgiving and some things are not. Um, sometimes you can cover, um, you can cover your seeds with fabric, sometimes cardboard or even a light mulch or whatever, so that you don't have to, like say you work 12 hour shifts or something like that. It can get really sketchy when it comes to keeping these things wet or like carrots, unforgiving. You can't let them go dry ever. Um, and they take a full week to two weeks to germinate. So they're very tricky um, if you can't be on top of them every day, right? So covering them with something to keep them protected while they germinate uh, may be necessary. But for at least uh, three days to three weeks, and it is crop dependent, so you'll have to consult your seed packet again, you're going to need to keep them moist. Um, there's kind of no way around that. When you first plant, it's kind of is a critical time and you got to stay on top of them a lot more. But it gets easier. Then you gradually reduce the watering over a period of weeks until you're only watering two to three times a week max. Way better to water well two to three times a week than to water every day. You want to mark, also mark the date that you're planting things because you want to, you're fertilizing right now. You want to you want to think ahead. Mark your calendar. If you plan everything one weekend, look at the calendar and 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 look six weeks ahead. Go ahead and set an alarm on your phone, you know, so that you can fertilize again. Some people call that side dressing. Um, your seed pack will tell you whether or not you can. So indoors or outdoors and when, planting depth, all of that, final plant spacing. I mean, final plant spacing is um, sometimes you, uh, to guarantee germination, it's a numbers game. You overplant a little bit so that, you know, whatever percent of failure you have, you're still covered. Well, then you're too successful. You have too many plants and you, you have to thin. I've made the mistake so many times because it's, we were just talking about this. So, you know, you plant, you've got all these things and you, you have to make a decision of who lives and who doesn't, you know, and thin it down. And uh, that can be a time where you can be tempted to leave things, you know, too close. So it's, it's, it's hard to plant things and then yank them out of the ground. We're just, you know, we didn't plan them to do that, but, um, you do want to think about that. What is the final plant space and how many days to harvest um, for direct sowing or after transplanting? Typically, the date for transplants goes from the day you stick it in the ground. Okay. Uh, yeah, I put a video in here. Let's see if this works. Um, this is a little tip on how to plant really fine seeds. The big seeds, people don't struggle with. The tiny seeds, though, are tough. They're tougher. Direct sowing seeds out of the garden can offer challenges, especially when those seeds are very small. Here's a little trick to help you sow those small seeds a little bit better and get a little better spacing on seed. After opening up your furrow in the garden right here, take a piece of toilet paper and line that furrow with the toilet paper, and you can basically anchor this down a little bit to keep the wind from taking it away. But now what the toilet paper does, you don't have to do a white background so you can see where these very small seeds are going. So now you can take your very small seed, here's some dill seed, and as they hit the piece of paper, you can see exactly where they're at. You can get a little better spacing on that. After you sow the seed, you can then take soil and cover up the seed at the recommended spacing, 
And after you cover it up, you can water it lightly, and the seeds will be on the way to duration. Another tip that you can do to keep this grow uniformly moist, which is very helpful in getting good uniform duration, is to take what's called a wet flat. This is something that your annual flowers come in. And because of the fact it has this lattice bottom to it, you just take and turn this over the top of your row, put something on top of the flat to keep from blowing away. But now this acts as a shade. It offers about 50% shade. It will keep that row uniformly moist throughout the duration process. And what's interesting about that, in about 10 days to two weeks, depending on what kind of seed you sow, this is the result of that sowing. The paper that was here originally has all disintegrated, and now we have this nice uniform row, in this case, flex. But you see, this can help you in sowing a very tiny seed. Okay. okay. Now that um, is definitely more of like a square foot garden technique. If you're going to do 50 feet of something, you know, um, well, you couldn't have done that in 2020, could you? That'd be very expensive. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's an interesting idea for, for uh, uh, square foot gardening. Here's a technique that I've used a lot, and that's to use either clay sand, or you can use, I, I have a colander that is a garden colander. You can um, sift uh, some soil and get the real fine soil, put it in some sort of shaker. I've used old Parmesan cheese, you know, the pizza cheese. Keep those bottles when you're, keep a bottle when you're empty. Anyway, you want to mix the fine seed. Like if you look like at like clover, it's like a thimble for an acre. You know, how do you do that? You have to cut it. You have to mix it with something. Anyway, once you add some bulk to it and mix it up in your shaker, if you go along and shake that out, you're, you're going to have a much more random, consistent uh, uh, dispersion. And you'll be able to see where you're going because it's mixed with, with sand. You'll be able to see that contrast of where you're going. If you were going to do a whole bed, like say you were going to do a whole raised bed of lettuce or kale or something like that, you would, you would just watch it and you would, you would make sure you evenly spread out whatever you're using. You could use cornmeal, something with some color, you know, to offset it. So you can tell how even spread. You'll have, uh, um, better odds because if you try to do it by, you know, it's going to be patchy. It's hard. It's hard to do this. Um, another trick for uh, dealing with really, really small seeds, like if you're if you're planting these in, in trays or whatever, is to use a toothpick or a skewer, like for shrimp or whatever, or a pencil eraser. And if they're moist, they'll just stick right to the seed. And then when you you can just twist it a little bit, right in your dirt, and it falls off. And so it's sort of like uh, the water, the moisture and the surface tension somehow or another is like magnetic on those tiny little seeds. All right. Um, so that's it for, for dealing with, those are the basics on dealing with seeds. Um, I'll tell you this, another, another thing that's really good for big hard seeds if they have a waxy coat is you can take an emery board or a piece of sandpaper like fine sandpaper and scuff it before you, you know, it's got this wax coating on it. Um, you can scuff that before you put it in the hole and then it will, while it's sitting there, while it's getting moist and loosening up, it'll moisten up a lot faster with that scuffed uh, exterior to sort of break that wax layer up a little bit. Okay. You want to pre-wet your plants. Um, I, I like to do this first. Um, then it can, um, you know, it's not soaking wet by the time you uh, put it in the ground. Um, but they are moist because once you put them in the hole, the surrounding soil is going to dehydrate them. Um, you want to check your packet or your plant tag, you know, it's variety specific on the spacing and all of that. Pre-dig your holes and add fertilizer. So, I mean, you 
to each their own, right? But if you've got to plant 10 plants, I typically dig my holes first and then fertilize in one shot and then go in with my plants in one shot, or lay them out and then fill them in. Um, if there's work to be done on the ground, I'm not getting up and down 10 times. You know what I mean? Um, I would look for, I've got some foam pads and knee pads too. Like the construction knee pads are fantastic for working on the ground. The foam pads too. I'll just lay, I'll just go ahead and lay them down the footpath. And then I'm on my knees, and I'm, you know, and so, hey, come on in, Beverly. There's some extra chairs right there if you need one. And there's everybody. I forgot to announce it. There's water in the back, too, if, if you need some. And um, let's see, where are we at? Oh, yeah, add your fertilizer in, one to two tablespoons per plant. Um, set it in the hole. Uh, making sure your uh, soil line is level with the base of the plant. That pretty much that that goes across the board, except for tomatoes. Tomatoes are a little different. We'll talk about them next. And then uh, just lightly uh, tamp the soil down around each plant. Water thoroughly, kind of like with seeds. You want to baby them at first. Um, uh, not as critical as with the germ with germinating, but uh, you definitely want to water daily for that first week and then start dialing back. Now tomatoes, <coughs> excuse me, you plant those deep or you can, you don't have to, if you can't, or for some reason your soil is such that you can't really dig a deep hole, um, you don't have to, you don't have to, they'll grow fine without doing this. But, the reason why people do this, it really does work, is that <coughs> if you look at the tomato plant, you'll notice the stalks are fuzzy. Um, there's that fuzz on them. Well, tomatoes are, they're a vining plant actually, and everywhere those fuzzies are, they can develop new root growth. They're unique in that way, right? So um, when they vine on the ground, um, um, where they make contact with the soil, they can shoot down roots, right? So by burying them up to the top, two or three sets of leaves, you want to leave like three sets of leaves, shoot for three. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, think about it fast forward a couple of weeks and your root ball is going to be so much more developed. Right. So that's why is because if you if you look ahead a month from the time you plant them com compared to planting at soil level, your root ball, your nutrient absorption, water absorption, all that is just going to be so much better. Do you take off? Yeah, I would just prune them, prune them down, um, just prune them off. Um, the, here's this, this photo example here is kind of diagonal. I've seen people talk about planting them in trenches. This is where it's practically like they lay it down and mound up dirt coming down this way. And then, you know, once, once they get established, the light pulls them up, you go straight up, don't think of straight up, but, um, um, so that's one way to do it in shallow trenches. Cause you know, if they plant 24 inches apart, you could dig a long trench and just kind of almost lay them in the end and you'd be at about the right space, right? So, um, so that's one way is the trench. And I just used post hole diggers and went straight down. So with mine, but I did do them in a straw bell garden where I had to lay them down, but it wasn't a trench. I was more like layering. I was piling dirt on top of them, but I did do that method. It's the best tomatoes I've ever had in a straw bell garden. Okay, so fertilizer. We'll just kind of cover some fertilizer basics. Um, um, organic versus uh, synthetic or conventional uh, fertilizer. Um, typically, when you're looking at fertilizer, there's three numbers associated. You'll see a, a, 
a bag of fertilizer, if it says that it's a balanced fertilizer, they're talking about a, a balance of three main ingredients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now the Latin name for potassium starts with the letter K. So you'll see N for nitrogen, P for phosphorus, and K for potassium. And um, the nitrogen is mostly associated with leaf growth. Uh, phosphorus for root growth, and potassium um, for fruiting bodies. Um, so when you see a number like 543, that means 5% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, 3% potassium by weight. So, well, we'll do some math here. Let's see. So soil tests are often given with conventional fertilizer recommendations. So to convert that to organic, Either, either either direction, you just think about it in percentages. So, for example, a pound of nit if you need to add a pound of nitrogen, then you would need to apply 20 pounds of 543 um, um, to equal the one pound of nitrogen because the five only represents 5%. Okay. In general, try to fill your nitrogen requirements from your soil to wet test using a balanced organic fertilizer. Uh, basically, this confused me for a while. What they're basically saying is when you get your soil test, don't overreact and treat like the whole garden. Treat, you know, fertilize as you go. If, you're, if you get a soil test and it comes back weird, let's talk about it. And, and decide if there's something specific that you need, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to add all those additional ingredients if you don't need them. Nitrogen washes out, whereas phosphorus and potassium do not. So it's you know it's kind of one of those things. That's why you know if you're gonna um, add something, let's just think about it before we go there. Um, if say you had, if for example, let's say you did have, um, high levels of phosphorus and potassium and needed to add nitrogen specifically, the organic sources of that are alfalfa meal, blood meal, feather meal, fish meal, and cottonseed meal. Most of the meals are, you can think, direct sources of, uh, of nitrogen. And then for phosphorus, you got your bone meal and your rock phosphate. Organic sources of potassium or green sand, sunflower, whole ash. Just, just know and understand that if you get a soil test and you see it and there's specific uh, uh, things, we'll just need to look for those specific things. All right. I'm handing out this stuff tonight, Harmony 543 organic fertilizer. It's a balanced, it's, and it's, um, it's actually a, a slow dissolve, uh, nitrogen as well, which is important. If you're looking at fertilizers, understanding that nitrogen washes out, um, you know, means that you, you kind of do want slow release nitrogen. Um, if you don't use a slow release nitrogen, I don't know, watch, watch how much it rains and you'll have a guess about how long you know how long it's going to stay in there but it will wash out if it's a slow release it's going to hang around a lot longer so if you read the package it's going to say six to eight pounds per thousand per hundred square feet and a pound is right at two and a half cups so that's going to be 15 to 20 cups per hundred square feet we're back to our magic number of a hundred foot row right so um, depending on how long of an area you're uh, fertilizing or planting at that moment, you you can figure out about how much to uh, um, put in there. But you can figure a cup and a half to two cups every every uh, ten feet, so or two tablespoons per square foot. You're just going to have to kind of figure it out. Every situation is going to be a little different. 
Um, <clears throat> all right, so don't scatter the fertilizer over your entire garden. When I started out, this is what I was doing. I had one of those broadcast cedar things, and I just load the hopper with fertilizer and fertilize the whole garden, you know, a couple times a year, three maybe, you know, or whatever. I, that's what I started doing. And um, because that's what that's what my grandfather did. And um, I don't know. I'd love to have a conversation about that now and just talk about it, uh, about uh, um, what he was doing, because you're just adding more and more phos phosphorus and potassium every year to the areas that don't grow. That's why if you start to see high levels of uh, phosphorus or potassium, there's probably a garden at one time. Anyway. <clears throat> so don't uh, scatter or fertilize uh, the, the whole garden. You'll just be feeding the weeds and wasting your fertilizer. Um, uh, you want to put it directly uh, where you're, where you're going to grow, in the hole or in the seed trench for best results. <sighs> Let's take a breather here. We're at our next section. Anybody got any questions? We're at it. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look, if you if you use something if you use something conventional, like there's some really high power stuff, like uh like thirteen triple thirteen, triple twenty five, they got triple ten, you know, if if it's really re if you if you're gonna use that kind of stuff, I'd start in really, really good. But this harmony is organic, it's slow release, don't worry about it burning your seeds or anything like that. But if you're gonna use a higher strength uh, fertilizer, I would I would uh, just make sure you stir it in real good. That's all. Do you Um, <clears throat> okay, so there's certain things you have to, like, mostly tomatoes and peppers, okay? They're, they're so sensitive when they're younger, very, very hard to get them to maturity, uh, planting directly in the ground. Tomatoes and peppers, you're going to want to start in seed trays, indoors or protected or something. Everything else is optional. Um, it can be an issue of money, you know, to buy live plants or transplants is significantly more expensive than seeds. So like, for example, the, the, the nursery sell a lot of zucchini, squash, watermelon, you know, these, these things, but in Tennessee, they grow so easy right now. They grow so easy in the ground that unless it's just a, a matter of convenience or you ran out of time, it's late and you didn't, you know, you, unless there's a really, really good reason to buy transplants, you can save that money because they grow so well here. If we were in a different part of the country, I, that might be different. So, but here, um, pretty good. Anyone else? All right. <clears throat> Preventing weeds with mulch. Um, this really is one of the single best things you can do for your garden for a lot of different reasons. Um, um, but to, to, to save time and energy up front uh, with weeding, with watering, um, mulching ahead of time is, is really uh, great. You know, we don't have it in the budget to give everybody, um, you know, a whole you know, a whole bunch of straw bales or whatever. And I wish we did because it, it's really that critical. Um, there are so many free sources, though. If you collect, start now, anybody starting to garden, um, I would advise to uh, start collecting leaves. If you don't have trees on your property, make friends with your neighbors. You know, they'll give you their leaves and get all that you can. Get the whole neighborhood's worth of leaves in the fall. Pile them up, save them, mulch with them, 
compost them. It's just really great. And, um, um, but you know, weeding is one of the things, if you talk to people who really want to garden, but they haven't yet and they're on the fence or whatever, you talk to people about, you know, what strikes fear in the hearts of beginning gardeners fighting weeds is at the top is, you know, on the list. Cause it's like, well, I really want to garden, but I don't want to fight the weeds all year or all the time. And it's, it's optional. Let me put it that way. It's optional. It does require some other work though. Um, but it blocks the light, uh, from the soil surface, um, traps in moisture and stops the weeds from germinating, uh, because of the light. It conserves water, prevents the soil from drying out, prevents soil borne diseases uh, from spreading. Um, a big, a big thing with uh, soil, soil borne diseases is splashing when it rains and mulch dampens that and stops. If you, if you see a garden that's not mulched, look at their tomatoes or plants. There's usually kind of like on the side of the house, there's like a line of mud that goes up two feet. You know what I mean? And that's from the dirt splashing and the mulch will uh, prevent that. It, are you yeah. talking the whole garden? Are you talking the whole garden or are you talking the foot beds now? Like where are you mulching the whole thing? Um, I would, as a, if possible, mulch the whole thing as a priority around your plants. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be better off to save it because you know what? Your foot pads are going to compact. And they're going to get some weeds, but not as much. And it's just, it's the, you know, in the, the hierarchy of it all, soil health is just so much more important. Yeah. Then, then, yeah. So I would target, like, if you had limited resources, I would target my plants first, footpaths secondary. Cause you can also. The footpaths and borders are a good opportunity for fabric, cardboard, you know, uh, scavenged items of all sorts, so plastic, you know, all sorts. I did tell you guys though, cardboard, look, if you put cardboard in your footpaths, do be careful till it gets worn in. Cause if there's layers of fresh brand new, it's slick. It's very slick till it gets watered down and, gets a little, you know, worn and starts to become part of the ground. Um, it can be slick, very slick. <clears throat> uh, mulch, typically don't, don't remove it. I might uh, round it up and use it for some fall gardening somewhere, but typically let it decay and become a part of the garden. And if you're using leaves, uh, it's, it's even better. It, it just, it breaks down, becomes part of the garden and adds organic matter. Mulch materials, all kinds of things. Straw, old hay, uh, um, yeah. If you're, sometimes you will see bales of, of straw that's, that have seed heads in it. I would just look at them, just spot it. If you happen to know, it's, it's not super common, but if you see them in there, don't get those. Um, there's going to be a certain percentage of seeds in there anyway, but it's very easy to fight off rye grass, wheat grass, oak grass. It's very, very easy compared to turf grasses. It's very easy to work around that stuff, uh, but you don't want a lot of Okay, so just, just be aware that sometimes there are seed heads in the bales. Shredded leaves, fantastic. Grass clippings is always on, on the list. Um, if you mow regularly and don't let your yard uh, go to seed, grass clippings are really great. And if you always collect them in a pile, after a while, you'll end up with an old pile. And that's the really good stuff. So grass clippings. Uh, Shredded paper, people do it. Um, all kinds of other organic waste. Bark or wood chips that have been composted for at least a year. You really don't want to use fresh, fresh cut or chip wood chips because of, of pH issues. You want to let them mellow for about a year before you put that in a garden in any 
mass quantity. Well, there's a whole bunch out here. I think we're gonna we're gonna do some permanent beds with some wood chips, but they're they're out there mellowing right now. You know, they'll be good eventually. All right, pile it up thick, real thick. Six inches um, is a good start. Um, if you can, it's way easier. If you can imagine, you know, if you're going to mulch any significant am amount of area, it's easier to mulch it before you plant. Um, um, it's so important if you have planted, if you planted seeds, let them come up a little bit. One thing I've done is I've, I've mulched really thick on the sides and I've had my seed bed going down there. And as they get taller and taller, I just push it in a little closer and closer and eventually get there. But, uh, um, but I have gone ahead and put my mulch down the foot, foot pads because, you know, that was kind of doing something while my seeds were germinating. And then I just pushed it up closer. You want to stay on top of any uh, weeds that do emerge and keep them from going to seed. One thing with the, the wheat and the oak grass, one technique for dealing with the grass that does pop up, the little bit that does pop up, is just moving the straw around. You know, you see an area where there's a bunch of grass coming up through the stuff. You can go under there with a pitchfork and lift it up and then just set it right back down. And it lifts up off the straw and then crushes it. That's enough to kill that stuff um, um, when it's young. And seriously, after a little while, it just quits coming up because the seeds are done. You know, once those seeds are exhausted, it just, it, it, it's done. Landscape fabric, uh, there's several products out there uh, made from woven poly polypropylene fabric. Uh, some some is more uh, permeable to water than others, um, but these are typically best combined with drip irrigation. Um, you know, if you were going to water on a regular basis, you would you would definitely have to be. Look, that's a lot of holes this guy's putting in this thing. You imagine having a target like to really target your watering on those holes and be very, very time consuming, but, um, typically used with drip irrigation, but people do use them in the garden. I, for, you know, small scale backyard garden purposes, this stuff would be great as foot pads and borders as well, rather than planting directly in. It. So think about that too. Um, this stuff, if you were wondering, these holes in here are actually burned in rather than cut. And what that does is that singes the edges and what like if people who use this system, let's say their garden is 25 feet long rows, you know, they would have a 25 foot strip pre burned with holes at a certain pattern. They might have a two foot pattern, a one foot pattern. This guy's got what one foot square, you know, this is probably lettuce or something here. And that's like, that becomes a planting template. Uh, but they're burned in there, so they don't fray and fall apart. This is not here. Okay, she's not here tonight. Um, this is a brand new garden that's starting out. No till. And uh, I was going to have her talk about this a little bit. But we'll skip. We're going to look at some examples of uh, mulch here. This garden here, you can see there's cardboard all around the perimeter. Um, I wanted her to tell us more about it. We've got landscape fabric here. I don't know if the plan is to actually burn holes and grow in this, or if this is just being used as a, like a silage tarp right now, but it, it's got lines in it like it's, like it's landscape fabric. And um, trying to remember the garden plan. Oh, this is going to be, this area is, is lightly tilled and that's going to be uh, carrots, and, carrots and root vegetables. This is a garden from 2020, I think. You can see there's 
a combination here. There's uh, straw around these tomato plants. Let me turn on my pointer on. I'm pointing thinking you can see it. You can see straw around the tomato plants, but there's also paper in the foot pads. This is an amazing picture, amazing harvest picture. Look at all this cardboard and stuff. That's what I really wanted you to see. Here's a cute one. And again, there's cardboard, straw. This is Cheryl's garden. There's three, there's three things happening here. Landscape fabric, cardboard. Over here is straw. And this looks like, I would have to ask her the order she did it in. I believe she put her T-post in first, then straw, and then planted. There we go again. Look at all this straw. And you can see some grass popping up here, but it's not overrun with weeds. What is this? Beans. Or beans. You know, I've had probably the cleanest like melon patch or pumpkin patch, pump that I've ever grown, I grew in an edge that was mulched there, but I trained them to go off the edge of the garden and I had laid down cardboard ahead of time and let them grow over the cardboard. And so, because you know, most melon patches by the end, by the end of the season, they look, you know, they're a weed fest really, because it, you can't, you know, you can't get in there and all that stuff. So um, if you don't mulch ahead of time, you ain't mulching. So, you know, and you're not going to stop those weeds either. Uh, but this was mulched ahead of time. You can see there's a lot less drama in here. Um, here's, this is interesting. This corn is uh, mulched, but some sort of winter squash or something got out of hand and ended up growing right through the middle of it. Took a picture of it for some reason. Here's some mulching in a raised bed. More and more mulch. All right. <clears throat> so now we're moving on to trellises. Trellising is a form of vertical gardening. Um, when you look at things that, that vine and take up a lot of, you know, they got a big footprint, you can... If they vine, you can take advantage of that and grow them straight up. And trussling is a way to do it. Tomatoes, cucumbers, small melons, squash, and pole beans can all be grown vertically on trellising. It is best to install your trellising um, either before or at the same time you plant. You can plant a row of tomatoes and then come in and do your trellising and mulching and all that, but you risk stepping on it. And no matter how careful you are, I mean, it's, you know. Uh, for cucumbers, melons, squash, pole beans, you need to install T-posts at the ends of the row and then space them evenly in between, as evenly as possible in between, every five to eight feet. And for tomatoes, you want to install them at the end of the row and then space them every five feet or so. It's just that tomatoes are very heavy. You know, tomato plant is very, very heavy. And um, you'll see a lot of a lot of people. You know, I've used the cheap. You used to could get them at Ace Hardware in Ohio uh, for ninety nine cents. These tomato steaks, and those just aren't. You know, they're cheap and they're fine in between. But you really need a solid, you need a solid post every so many because they do get really heavy. And then if you add a gust of wind on top of that, they're really, really heavy. And they'll snap, you know, they'll, they'll snap those uh, tomato steaks right off. So those tomato steaks may be a good option for kind of saving some money, getting a little extra length and putting them in between but I would not rely a hundred percent on those. They're just not, they're just not really strong enough. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we hand out some trellis netting 
and we're going to give you some zip ties too um, to attach the you can see here this tre trellis netting is attached to the t-post uh, just with zip ties now we have had people use trellis netting and then grow tomatoes and tie the tomatoes to the trellising as it as it grows and it's fine too um, typically re recommend uh, something called the Florida weave for uh, tomatoes it's uh, it's kind of an adaptive thing you kind of go as you grow um, and it's cheap um, so basically what you're gonna do you're gonna install your t-post plant your tomatoes and then you're gonna wrap twine you're basically going to hug the plants with twine between each post and so you plant your plants you don't do anything yet you wait till they get up about 12 inches or a little bit taller and then you start with a row and then as they grow you do another layer about every six inches now what can happen is if you have tomatoes at different varieties, you'll notice that some are really tall. And so like, let's say that if in here, these were really tall, we would be weaving way ahead of these guys down here. You know, so you think about it in sections uh, as well, uh, because the height different, the height differences does, does get um, um, weird. Yeah, keep the string as uh, tight as you possibly can. Um, and then for every six inches of plant, wrap another uh, layer of twine around it. Here's some, here's some photos. I've experimented with, with both. Uh, like if you see here, I've experimented with zigzagging in and out between each plant and then going the opposite way. You know, so that they're really hugged in there and um, or just going on the outside. And um, I don't know. I can't tell you which was better. I do know that that sometimes you'll get a really heavy one and they'll want to lay down or they'll want to move over into its neighbor's space. And so what I would do is then come in here with like a twist tie or string and try to like keep it you know give it a little boundary give it a lane to stay in but that's the uh, florida weave it's kind of it's a commercial tech i saw it first as a commercial uh technique on a farm tour i did and i started i started using it and it replaced all my tomato cages because it's just you don't have that gear um it works it's cheap and um anyway Let's see. Oh, I sent out a video today with Lexi did uh, Lexi did the Florida weave and it was like a raised. It's a cool video. I'll tell you a little bit about it in case you don't notice it. It's a raised bed and it looks like they bent conduit to make hoops over the bed to put covering on in the winter. Well, what they did was you can tell in the middle of the bed, it looks to me it looks to me like Swiss, either Swiss chard or maybe rhubarb or something kind of cooler weather is growing in the middle of this bed. But on the edge, they companion planted tomatoes and they did the Florida weave off the hoops. Anyway, it was cool. It was cool to see um, them do that. All right. We're almost there, y'all. Water. Think about watering before you plant. It's so important. Um, try to come up with a plan for your watering uh, before you plant. If you have water issues, <coughs> uh, be working on that. Uh, plants need an inch of water every week. If it's consistently above 90 degrees most of the week, they need an extra inch to two inches. So if it's consistently above 90 degrees in a week, you're talking three inches of rain. It's a lot of water. Um, if you mulch, you can keep that down to the 
to the one inch extra week, you know, number. If you don't mulch, it's definitely all the extra water. Okay. Um, to give you an idea, one inch of water equals two thirds of a gallon. Okay. So for a, so just, just whatever your square footage is, multiply that times 0.66 and that's, that's one unit, right? That's one inch of water. So if it gets hotter, double that or triple it. Okay. So 500 square foot garden equals 330 gallons of water each week. Um, some water will come from the sky. So you get to subtract that. Not every week do you even need to water. Um, I would suggest you get a rain gauge so that you can tell. This place is cursed. It could rain everywhere in Morristown and it will not rain here. So you cannot trust the, the news report. Okay. If you, if you fool around and you miss the news report, there is a way to go back and look at the previous, uh, rainfall. I've got some, I sent out copies of these slides. So they're in there. I should have put that in the, the website. I mean, in the email today, but you can look back and see how much, uh, rain they're pulling. I think I put this, there's a couple of different collections and I, I picked, let's see, it rained, uh, last, uh, I did a comparison. It rained last Wednesday, but I don't think it rained at the airport. It rained at the other place. I don't know exactly where it's located, but it didn't rain at the airport. So, and it rained 0.33, it rained a third of an inch at the other location. So it gets weird, right? So the best thing to do is to have your own, uh, have your own rain gauge. Um, but that's it, but it's, it's good to know because it, it always happens when I'm thinking, when did it rain? Did it rain much? You know, and I still have to guess it's not as good as having the rain gauge, but at least you can look back and, and see. All right. When you're watering by hand, water is complicated, right? It depends on the size of the hose, how many kinks are in the hose, your water pressure, the size of the line and all that. There, there's a lot of factors that go into it. One way to do it is whatever, you know, get your setup, your hose, your sprayer, your stuff, and then take a, take a bucket and time yourself filling it up. And then you'll get an idea. And yeah, I'm, I'm guarding, I'm counting one, two, three, four, you know, and it's, you'll get used to your pressure, your volume of, of water. You're going to have to kind of calibrate your mind to, to understand how much water is what, you know? And, um, yeah, use, use the gentle shower. Don't use the, the pressure washer, the, the setting. Um, you, you do want to water the roots and not the leaves when possible. Water early in the morning so that the plants can dry off. That's the, that's the big deal, especially when you start getting into zucchini, squash, tomatoes, things that are, things that are known to be, uh, susceptible to fungus. Um, you definitely want to give those a chance to dry out throughout the day. Can't do anything about rain, but, um, when we water ourselves, uh, we can. Here's the thing though. Overhead irrigation is convenient and cheap. And can, you know, sometimes the convenience of things means they get done more regularly. Um, but same thing again, if you are using overhead uh, sprinklers, take time to put a rain gauge or two out in your sprinkling area to get a feel for how long, you know, time it, see, you know, time it and see how, how much it fills up in 30 minutes and, and get an idea for how long. And once you figure out where, you know, that inch is, well, if you're watering half an inch, you'll know to do that twice a week if it doesn't rain. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, again, water early in the morning. And um, uh, something good with this is you can, you know, once you know how long you need to go, you could uh, you can pair this with a timer. So, drip irrigation is the most efficient way, and by efficient meaning that every drop gets used, you know, uh, uh, more compared to other methods. Um, but it's also the most expensive to set up. Basic garden kit will run you a hundred, two hundred dollars, uh, but you know it, you should get about five years out of it. The drip tape will need to be replaced every every one to three years. I think there's some more, there's some slightly more expensive orchard uh, tape that you can get that'll last like 10, 10 years or so. But um, um, it waters the roots directly, and if, com if combined with a uh, uh, landscape fabric, uh, the water stays stays there. Best paired with a, a timer to run on schedule. And watering deeply every two to three times a week is better than watering every day. However, if it's above 90 degrees, you can help them out. I mean, you know, um, use uh, thick mulch to conserve water and uh, water the roots, not the leaves. That's it. Questions? Yes. I would I would put it on the root, just off center. Yeah. Anyone else? It's a lot of information. Um, and if you don't have questions now, you might later. So, who is who? Um, Listen, I know not everybody's into the Facebook thing, but I need to close the group because people are asking to join, right? And that's why I keep it closed, typically. So if you're going to join the Facebook group but haven't yet, go ahead and do that because I'm going to lock it down again. I hate telling people no, you know? it's It just... Because uh, they just want to be a part of. I get that, but... There's reasons to keep it just us. That's more important. And I, you know, I just, I hate telling people no, so I typically keep it locked down. So I'm gonna go ahead and lock that down again. I just wanted to tell y'all, if you're coming, come on. Yeah, search Grow Morristown and ask to join and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add you a little later on this evening. I'm sure I'll get a notice. Okay, yes sir. Okay, is it is it an open top barrel? I see it's closed, but you know, I'm still speaking. Yeah. Okay. There's a there's some things you can do. Some people do get some cheap olive oil. You've heard of that. If a gold, if goldfish will live in it, you can have goldfish, right? There's also a barrel. Uh, it, they look like hairnets. They look like hairnets that kind of you know, fit over the top of the barrel. Um, there's some chemical tablets and stuff, but you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. If if any rain barrel set, we, we just are putting some new stuff out there. You can take pictures right now because it's it's only going to look pretty for so long. But the sun, the sunlight and the water, the algae is going to come. It's going to look pretty yucky. Um, if as long as it's for gardening only, they don't have, you know, most water testing systems, if you're going to feed it into a gray water system where you're going to drink it, you're going to filter it and drink it, you really need to clean everything. You know, so that sunlight can't get through, and you eliminate a lot of that. But 
Most rain barrels get pretty nasty. It's perfectly okay. It doesn't bother you. It does not bother you. If it does bother you, get all black. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, I've got a trailer out front. Are your, Joe, are your dogs out there? We're probably... Yeah, let's let Joe uh, move to guard dogs. And uh, um, I've got, I'm going to go out there and kind of coordinate with you. I've got eight T posts for everybody. So they're in bundles of five. So uh, it'll be better to keep the bundle together if possible. But, but I do need to cut some of them so that you can get eight a piece. Then. I finally came up with a pretty nifty way of doing the trellis netting. So I've got the trellis netting for you. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a bag of the Harmony fertilizer. Um, I will send out a spec sheet on that fertilizer so you can actually see the label for yourself and read the label for yourself. Okay. But um, what I'm giving you is just the Harmony. Anything. Um, what else? I have, okay, the, I'm, if anybody has some good ideas on this, I have boxes of tomato twine. The stuff is bulletproof. It's cheap. It's fantastic for doing this floor to leave with tomatoes. The problem is, is it comes in like 10,000 feet on a roll. And I don't know how to cut that up. I don't know how to. You know what I mean? I need like a jig with a power, a, I don't know, something. I need a way to like have a drill or something and, you know, give you 300 feet of it or whatever, you know? And, but I have to figure out a way to get you guys some of this. In, in past years, uh, some people got this stuff and some people didn't. And some bought string and, some use rope. I mean, it's used, you can use anything. It's just string. But I do have some really good string uh, if you want it. If you bought it, you, you could buy it at Morristown. I don't know that Lowe's or Home Depot have it, but you could get it at Morristown Milling. I think it's about nine or ten bucks a box and would last you a lifetime. It's, it's a lot of string. We just have to figure out ways to get it to you guys. But I have a few boxes out there. And I have a couple of, I've been surprised. I have two T-post pounders and very rarely has anyone borrowed them because neighbors have them. So many people have these things. So, but if you need a T-post pounder, you got to take a turn, but I've only got two of them for all of them. You got one? Yeah. Okay. So someone, if you're ready, to put the if you if you think you're ready, you like you know where these posts are going and you're gonna go ahead and put them in. I got two T post pounders. Someone can take home with, with them tonight and drop it off up here or something. If uh you if you borrow anything ever, you're here during business hours or whatever, just drop it off in the office. All right. They'll put it aside for me. If it's after hours or on the weekend or something, we'll communicate a place to hide it. Okay, and then I'll, so I'll have you hide it somewhere and I'll get, I'll get stuff, you know, we'll pass stuff back and forth through hiding it. All right, so Joe should be good now. Well, let's head out front. If you, now I'm kind of parked in front, so I think if you make, well, maybe if a couple of cars pull up next to me, we'll get you loaded up and then you can pull out of the way.